And now, please join us as Pastor Paul Gottlieb brings us today's message. Well, we're in a series called Blessed. It's been an amazing series, and we're going through the Beatitudes together, looking at what Jesus said in the Beatitudes uh, about being blessed. I think everybody, you know, if you're honest, you admit you want to live a blessed life, want to have a blessed marriage, want to have a blessed family, blessed career. Uh, but, you know, I want my life to be blessed. And Jesus taught on this, blessed, blessed are you. And the definition that we have given you week after week for what it means to be blessed is, is this, that that when you're blessed, the blessing means to be on the receiving end of the tangible and intangible favor of God. The question that we're asking in this series really isn't, does God want to bless us? Because we know that he does. The question that we're asking in the series is, am I blessable? Am I living in a way that God can bless me? Over and over again in the Bible it says, blessed are you if you do these things. When you do these things, you will be blessed. If you do this, you will be blessed. And what we've seen in this series is that God's love is unconditional. We're not talking about God's love. God loves you. He loves me, period. That's going to never shift or change. Nothing you can do will uh, impact God's love on your life. Nothing you do uh, will make him love you more or less. God loves you. But the blessings of God, however, are conditional. Each of these beatitudes, each of these thoughts underscores this thought, blessed are the. Each of these statements and these beatitudes go on to define really a condition of God's blessing. And the word bless in the Greek, it means to be happy. It means to be fortunate. It, it also carries along with it this thought of joy and a spiritual joy or satisfaction that really goes beyond our conditions. It carries you through the pain, through the sorrow and the loss and grief that this life will throw at us. We might face a lot of things in this life, but God says you can still be blessed. And when Jesus starts his most famous message, this Sermon on the Mount, he begins with this. He says, I'm going to teach you eight conditions for receiving God's blessing in your life. Last week, we looked at number six, which was blessed are the pure in heart, Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It was a great message. If you missed last week, get the CD. We have it out here on the table in the lobby like we do every week. You can also go online to Bethel.org or the app and watch it. Go watch it. Go look at it. Today, however, we're going to look at number seven, the seventh of the eight statements made by Christ in Matthew 5. Today, we're going to talk about peace makers. Blessed are the peacemakers, it says in Matthew 5, 9. Let me read it to you. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. One of the most important uh, life skills that you and I have to learn in this life is that we need to learn uh, how to resolve conflict, conflict resolution, how to resolve a conflict, how to restore and reconcile broken relationships. And if we don't learn this in life, if we don't learn how to do this, we're going to spend a lot of our life miserable. Because the truth is, how I many know this is true? You and I, we are imperfect people. We're just no perfect people. If you find the perfect person, don't talk to them. You're going to mess it all up. Just leave them alone. There are no perfect people. There's problems. And if you run from conflict, if you try to get away from it, it it's not going to work. You're going to be miserable and unhappy much of your life. And so this is an important skill that you have to use to resolve conflict, conflict at our work. Uh, you have to know how to, how to resolve, you know, conflict in your marriage, with your children, conflict with your friends, in this community, even in church, in small group, literally everywhere. You can use this at conflict resolution when you're driving through the Trader Joe's parking lot at the Prune Yard. It works. <laughs> You're going to need it. I always find conflict there for some reason. <laughs> Here's the problem with this. Almost nobody teaches us how to do this, the how-tos on conflict resolution. Yet this is one of the most important skills to your happiness in life. So today you picked a good day to be at church. I highly recommend that you take notes today because what we're going to look at today are steps on how to resolve conflict and restore broken relationships. In fact, Jesus will attach 
blessing. Think about that. He's going to attach blessing and the favor of God to this point, understanding conflict resolution. This is what he's going to say. You need to know that at some point in your life, you're going to deal with this. If you're not dealing with it today, you're going to deal with it. So take notes today. Pass them on to your friends, children, because chances are that at some point you're going to need this. Nobody's teaching them, so we're going to teach them today on resolving conflict. Matthew 5 verse 9 says this. I want to read it to you again, our main verse today. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. One of the evidences that you are a child of God, proof that you are on your way to heaven, is that you are a peacemaker. Wow. Now, the term peacemaker, it, it comes with a certain amount of misconception. When you hear that word, sometimes we get it wrong. Let me begin today by telling you what this term is not referring to, what it is not. First is this. You need to know that being a peacemaker is not avoiding something. It's not avoiding the person. It's not avoiding the situation. It's not avoiding the conflict. It's not just saying, you know what, I'm just going to avoid that. Peacemaking, you know, does not mean you run from your problems. It does not mean that you pretend it doesn't exist. Anyone like that? Like, if I just work hard enough and pretend, maybe it'll go away. It doesn't mean that you convince yourself there is no problem. Running from problems is not the same as peacemaking. It is cowardice. Conflict is like a weed. You can neglect it. You can ignore it. You can walk by and hope it doesn't exist or that it disappears, but it only allows it to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, the second thing it's not is this. Peacemaking is not appeasement. It's good to know that. That peacemaking is not simply caving in and, and just giving in to what people want, giving in to their own way. Just because you're being passive and just because you're being quiet doesn't mean that you're a peacemaker. I want to remind us all today of, a, of this thought that Jesus was a confrontational person. Matter of fact, Pastor Brett preached a whole series called The Confrontations of Christ. Jesus stood his ground on a lot of issues. He confronted many people. And so peacemaking is not avoidance, and it's not appeasement. Peacemaking is this. Peacemaking is actively seeking resolution and restoration of a relationship. And so if we're going to be peacemakers, we have to work towards resolution. We have to work towards restoring broken relationships. So why should I be a peacemaker? That's the question I want to look at for a few seconds today. Why should I be a peacemaker? If you're taking notes, the first one is this. Unresolved conflict in our lives hurts my relationship with God. It hurts my relationship with God. This goes beyond just you and me. This impacts our very relationship with God. You cannot, listen to me, you cannot be right with God and wrong with people. This is horizontal and vertical relationships. And in your life, they come together at this intersection. God says, I can't claim to be close to God if I'm distant from somebody in my life and I've got conflict with them. It is an amazing thing that he says this. I heard somebody say this once. You're only as close to God as the person you love least. Think about that. This, us, these relationships impact our relationship with God. Look at what 1 John says. 1 John 4, verse 7 and 8, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. If you don't love, God says, you don't even know me. Don't even know me. And then verse 19, it goes on and it says this in 1 John 4, We love because he first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother. He is a liar. So you can't do it. You can't say, I love God, but I just, I don't like him. No. If you love God, and yet you hate your brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And then it goes on, and it says this. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Number two is this on why I must be a peacemaker. Number two is unresolved con conflict 
hinders my prayer life. It's an amazing thing when you start to see how this actually can hinder our prayer life. It, it keeps my prayers from being answered. Do you know that when you are out of whack in your relationships with each other, uh, the Bible says that God cannot hear your, pray your prayers, that it literally, they're connected, that these two points come together. Look at what 1 Peter 3, 7 says with me. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. God says, time out. When you don't have a good relationship and you're not treating your wife right, when you're not treating her right, this impacts your prayer life. I'm going to tell you right now, there is nothing in the world, there, there's nobody that I want to be angry at or bitter at or in conflict with enough that it can hinder my prayer life. It's not worth it. It's not worth having my prayers hindered because I'm out of relationship. If I'm out of relationship with my, my wife, if I'm not treating her with the respect that God wants me to, there, there is a problem, God says, I can't hear your prayers. There is a connection between, again, the horizontal and the vertical relationships. Now Luke chapter 10, verse 27, says, He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Do you see that? It goes hand in hand. You love God, yes, but you also have to love your neighbor. You, you, we don't get to have the privilege of saying, God, I love you. I just cannot stand that guy. <laughs> it doesn't work. God says, yeah, yeah, that's not, how, that's not how it works. Number three is this, why I need to be a peacemaker. Unresolved conflict destroys my personal peace and happiness. You know this, all of us, we know this from personal experience. You can have the money, you can have all the toys, you can have all the fame in the world, but if your relationships don't work, then you're miserable. I've met people where they've had it all. Fame and fortune, millionaires, professional athletes, famous people, and you find out their marriage is falling apart, their kids hate them, they're miserable, and yet they have it all. It's more than just that. You can, you can be on the greatest vacation and cruising around the world to all the exotic places. But if you're in conflict in your relationships, you are miserable. I was on that trip once. I went to Maui with, a, with some friends, and their marriage was really in a bad place. And even though I was in Maui, even though I was in paradise, their conflict in their marriage made the trip miserable. It wasn't even my conflict. It's like, come on, you're messing up Maui. I didn't even know you could do that. It doesn't matter. You can have all the nice things, but when you're in conflict, it messes everything up. James 3, verse 18 is a powerful verse. It says, peacemakers, that's what we're talking about today, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness, sowing and reaping. One of the laws of God's universe, what you plant grows. What you plant, you harvest in your life. You sow and you reap. And this is true both good and bad. If you sow gossip and anger and selfishness and sinful things, guess what you're going to reap? And if you sow peace, love, friendship, then you reap. You always reap what you sow. So how do I plant peacemaking? How do I sow peace, as it says here in James 3? How, how can I reap a harvest of being right with God. Well, I wanna, I wanna do something today. I wanna do an acrostic on the word peace that's gonna teach us how to be peacemakers. This is how you and I can live as a peacemaker. And the first one, if you're taking notes, the first one, the letter P is this. Plan to initiate peace. Plan to initiate peace. You have to make the first move. You don't wait for someone else. You take the initiative. You take that first step. It's easy to say, well, you know what? I didn't do anything wrong. I'm going to wait for them. The, the issues with them, I'm going to wait for them. That's not how peacemakers work. I, I know that some of you, you're thinking right now that just what I said, you know, it's not even my fault. It's their fault. When they come up to me, I'll be glad to face the conflict and deal with it. No, no, that's not right. God says he expects you to take the first step. 
That's what's called being a peacemaker, not just a peace keeper. It doesn't say blessed are the peacekeepers. We're not trying to just keep peace. We're trying to make peace where there is none. In Matthew 5, 23 and 24, just a few more verses. It's part of the same sermon Jesus is preaching. He's going to talk about initiating the process of reconciliation, that we have to take the first step. Look what it says. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Wow. God says, before you worship, before you come and sacrifice, before you come and have relationship with me, you need to make sure things are right with your brother. That things are right with him. Things are right with her. How are things with that one coworker? Stop. Don't go any further until we go get that taken care of. You take the initiative. Have you ever heard the expression that time heals all things? Well, it doesn't. It's not true at all, especially in relationships. You can wait decades. You can say, I'm not going to take the initiative. And you can wait and wait and wait, and nothing will be healed. If you've got cancer and you say, hey, I think I'll just wait this out, it'll get better. It doesn't. It's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And if you hold on to resentment, if you hold on to bitterness, it doesn't get better. It gets worse over the years, and relationships grow farther apart, and you get more hardened, and then your heart gets harder and harder. I've watched people, and I've listened to people over the years of doing ministry. They say, you know, years have gone by, and man, I haven't talked with my dad, and man, I haven't, I haven't made things right. And it doesn't get better because you ignore it. It gets worse. I want everybody in the room to write this down. The only way to truly resolve a conflict is to face it. You can't go around it, can't go over it, beneath it, behind it. You have to go through it. You have to make the decision. I am going to resolve the issue. You, me, peacemaker, we make the first move. E is this. E stands for empathize. Empathize. Put yourself in their shoes for a minute. Try to think about what they're feeling. Their side of the equation. James 1.19 says, My dear brothers, take note for this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Listen for their hurt. Listen to their perspective. It's very important that you listen to hurt because there's always hurt in a conflict. We think that we argue over ideas, but the truth is we're not arguing over ideas. We're arguing over emotion. We argue over feelings, feelings that have been hurt. Anytime there's a conflict, somebody had their feelings hurt. Somebody got hurt. Somebody felt slighted. Somebody felt abused. Somebody felt ignored. It's not the idea, really, that causes the conflict. It's the emotion behind the idea that causes conflict. Have you ever heard this phrase, hurt people, hurt people? That's what happens. In other words, the more I hurt, the more I lash out at everyone else, the more I try to hurt people. People who aren't hurting don't hurt others. People who are filled with love are trying to love others. People who are filled with joy are, are, are trying to be joyful towards others. People who are filled with peace are at peace with everybody else. But if I'm hurting inside, if this is all messed up and all I have on the inside is hurt, then I try to hurt. I'm going to try to hurt you. You know, if you asked me today for a $20 bill after service, don't do that. But if you did, <laughs> I can't give it to you. I can't give you what I don't have. It's impossible. And Hurting people can't give what they don't have. They can only give what they have, and that's hurt. Look at what Philippians 2 says, verse 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. See, restoration of relationships never happen when you're only looking at your own interests. Restoration never occurs when you're only considering your own perspective from it. Restoration never occurs when you're angry and you're only considering your needs and your perspective. Peacemaker, 
consider others and empathize with their perspective. A is this. A stands for assault the problem, not the person. Oh, I love this one. This one is so good and it hurts at the same time. <laughs> assault the problem, not the person. Our fight is not with flesh and blood. Our battle is not with the person. The issue is not the person. The issue is the issue. The problem is the problem. In Philippians 2, I know we just read it, but I want to read it again. Philippians 2, 4 says, Each of you, again, should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Again, get your eyes off of you and focus on them and try to help. Reconciliation only occurs when issues and problems and circumstances are dealt with correctly. You know, you never really gain reconciliation by attacking the other person. If you try that, you're going to find out quickly it doesn't work. Anytime you're busy fixing the blame, you're wasting energy not fixing the problem. And Proverbs 15.1 says this, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Ephesians 4.29, look at this verse with me. It says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, not your needs, not my needs, but to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. If you want a great example of this and what we're talking about, you don't have to look any further than Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is a great example of this. The president blames Congress for everything that's going wrong in our, our nation. Congress blames the White House for everything that's going wrong. The people blame the politicians. They forget they're the ones that voted them in. And all this blaming goes on and nothing is getting done. God's very specific about this kind, the kind of words that we use when we're trying to resolve conflict. Do you know that there are powder words or explosive words that you can use that create bigger problems? If you've been married at all, for like a month, you realize there are certain words you cannot say. Huh, this is good, but when my mom made this, she made... Don't say that. <laughs> Just calm down. Oh, don't say that. You know, there are words <laughs> that don't resolve the problem. It just escalates it. They ignite. They explode, destroying everything. Don't, don't use explosive words. If, and you can't use explosive words if you're going to be a peacemaker. Fix the problem. Don't fix the blame. Letter C is this. Confront from common ground. Confront from common ground. Try to meet in the middle. There's always common ground somewhere. You say, well, Paul, where, where is the common ground in a dispute? Well, the common ground is this. You both have a part in the problem. It takes two to tango. If you weren't a part of the problem, if you weren't even in, there wouldn't be a problem. There's always common ground. There's no sense in approaching reconciliation with this mindset uh, that, that you are faultless and that they're completely to blame. That's not going to help you. Even if you really feel that way, it's not true. Nothing will come from that. If there's conflict, remember, it takes two parties to create it. There's something there. Even if the conflict is like 99% their fault, you still have that one little percent that's probably your fault. And instead of accusing them and going, well, you know what? My part's so small. You're really the problem here. Instead of accusing them and excusing yourself, because don't we do that? We accuse them, excuse us of our part. Start your reconciliation effort with admitting what you did wrong. It sure disarms people when you come and say, look, I could have handled that better. Hey, you know what? I'm sorry. I should have called sooner. Hey, you know what? I have a part in this. As a matter of fact, James 5, 16, it says this. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Pray for each other. Confess your sins to each other. What is he talking about? Make things right. 
Pick things right. Be a peacemaker. Resolve conflict. And then you will be healed. Do you know the original Greek word here for healed in this verse? It means to heal. It means to cure. Or it means to restore. Relationships being restored and reconciled. And they get reconciled not when we say, well, it's my brother's fault. But when we confess our faults to one another and we work towards reconciliation. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 through 5 says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, hey, let me take that speck out of your own eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It starts with me. There's common ground here. I'm not going to come up and just start telling you what you did wrong and how messed up you are. I've got to look at the speck in my own eye first before I can see clearly on how to help move past this issue and resolve. It's important to remind ourselves of why the Bible says we have conflicts. Where do these conflicts come from? What is the cause of my conflicts? Well, it says this in James. If you want to know where conflicts come from, here it is. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Wow. The conflict that we're having, it doesn't start with other people. It's inside of me. It's inside of you. It actually starts inside of us. When I'm at peace inside, then what's outside doesn't even upset me. When I'm at peace on the inside, I'm at peace with God. I'm at peace with myself. And what's on the outside doesn't have the ability to upset me and bring distress on the internal, on the inside, eternally. How you and I are, are doing internally has much to do with how our relationships are functioning. Common ground. Yes, you are both at fault. We both have problems. Let's start from that perspective. Start with your own faults. And then you can begin to deal with the issues. E is this. The last point today on this lesson. Engage in reconciliation. This is the end result that we're trying to get to. This is what we want to see accomplished. Not just that you are at peace, but that we're creating peace, that we're, we're reconciling relationships and restoring relationships that have been broken. Romans 12, 18, look what it says. This is so powerful. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Focus on, on reconciliation, not resolution. There's a big difference here. Reconciliation means that, that I'm trying to reestablish the relationship. I'm trying to heal. We're, we're trying to bury the hatchet, if you will. It doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to remarry your ex. It, it just means that you're not going to hold on to the pain and the hurt. You're, you're going to live at peace with each other. You're not going to hold on to the hurt. You're not going to hold on to, to all that past hurt. Reconciliation. Reconciliation means that we're going to move past it. It doesn't mean that, you know, we're going to agree on everything. You know, there will be disagreements. That's going to happen, and here's why. Because the truth is, I have never met two people that agree on anything 100%. I don't even agree with myself 100%. I go back to like 10 years ago and listen to things that I said when I was preaching. I go, I don't even agree with that. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be things in your marriage, friendships with other people. You're, you're just never going to agree on because we're all different. But I love what Pastor Brett says over and over, and he said it so many times from this, this stage. We have to learn how to disagree without becoming disagreeable. That's called maturity. That's called wisdom. That's called being like Christ, to disagree without being disagreeable. Restoration is only possible when you approach a conflict with the goal of being reconciled. That's, that's what we're working for. If your goal is being right, 
If your goal is to be validated or, or vindicated, you're never going to be restored. Restoration of relationships is a common place in life for a peacemaker. Are you a peacemaker today? But even for a peacemaker, you got to remember you can only do so much. You can only put so much of the effort in. There, there, there are things that limit us. We see it in Re uh, Romans 12, 18 again. You and I, we are obligated, if it is possible, it says, as far as it depends on us to live. You're required to love, to do all you can, and when you have done all you can do, guess what? You're done. That's it. That's all you can do is what you can do. Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And that's the goal. That's what we're striving for. If you want a blessed life, if you want to live like Christ, if you want to walk in his blessings, then we have got to learn how to walk as peacemakers, not just peacekeepers, but bringing the peace of God with us to situations that have been broken. Matthew 5, 9. Bless are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Amen. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you for this word. Jesus, thank you for teaching us how to live a life that is blessed by you. And God, I pray today that we would live as peacemakers. Help us to take the initiative. Help us to work towards restoration and restoring relationships that are broken. Give us the strength today to do what maybe seems impossible for others. And with your heads bowed, your eyes closed today, I just want to challenge you. It's hard to walk as a peacemaker if you haven't first experienced the peace of God. Can't walk in peace if you haven't first experienced peace. And if you're here today, maybe you're not right with the Lord. If you're here today, things aren't where they should be. I want to say a prayer and lead you in a simple prayer. If you would, you can repeat these words right where you're sitting. Ask Jesus into your heart. Make peace with him so you can live a peaceful life, blessed the way God intended. So if that's you, would you just repeat these words with me right where you're at? Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I need you in my life. Would you forgive me you help me and make me new. From this day on, I promise to live for you. Thank you for what you've done for me. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.